It's a well-worn cliche, if, the, if I can help one person, but seriously, if just one person <laughs> pays attention to this, it'll be better than having nobody, you know, relate to this thing. So I am, thank you for giving me the, uh, the platform. If you know the songs, We're Not Gonna Take It and I Wanna Rock, then you're gonna know my guest on today's podcast. His name is JJ French, and he's the guitarist for the heavy metal band, Twisted Sister. Hello everyone, I'm Jamie Burr, CEO at Zero and host of the Zero podcast, Prostate Cancer Uncensored. JJ French is not only a rock star, but he's a prostate cancer survivor. And I was fortunate enough to spend time with him recently to talk about everything dealing with prostate cancer and the public eye to his next twisted business adventure. Also in this podcast, I chatted with Dr. Neelay Gandhi. Dr. Gandhi will set the record straight about possible factors that cause elevated PSA levels. For example, can sex or riding on a bike affect your PSA? Dr. Gandhi will have those answers a little bit later. You're listening to Prostate Cancer Uncensored, a podcast produced by Zero, the end of prostate cancer. This episode is brought to you in partnership with Bayer. And now, here is part one of Untwisted Straight Talk with Twisted Sisters JJ French. JJ spoke to Zero from his home in Manhattan. People obviously know you from Twisted Sister and you've remained in the spotlight since the 70s and 80s. Um, so when you were diagnosed with prostate cancer, was your first instinct to keep it quiet or to speak out about it in more of a public way? Tell me about that. Well, prostate cancer was not my first medical challenge. I had atrial fibrillation and I had a really bad case of atrial fibrillation and needed an operation. And I was one of the first people in New York to have ablation done. And it was a disaster. And um, when they pulled the catheters out, they tore my heart muscle, flooded my chest with 400 cc's of blood. My lungs collapsed and they wound up in the ICU. And not only did they not cure my AFib, but I got sicker. And um, this is a backdrop to the fact that prostate cancer was always floating around because of my father died of it. And my brother and I talk about it all the time. But putting that aside, I had to deal with this AFib business. And, and, and I had to become really a specialist in a AFib. And then my daughter was diagnosed with uveitis. In case you don't know what that is, it's like arthritis of the eyes. It's a complicated and rare eye disease that causes blindness. And I, and I had to become educated in uveitis. So I became so educated in AFib that I could talk to any doctor about it. I became so educated about uveitis that the, I have a whole website where I explain it, where even the guys who treat it thanked me for explaining it because it's a hard disease to explain. And I've raised money for the uveitis foundation. I don't need to raise money for the Cleveland clinic. They got enough places and they're the ones that cured my AFib. They have a lot of resources, but there's very few resources for, for uh, uveitis. So I realized how powerful it was that I was able to bring awareness to uveitis and bring money to, to that particular orphan's disease, as it's called, because it's part of the rheumatoid arthritis family, but it's an offshoot of it and very small offshoot of it. I think there's maybe 30,000 people in America. As you can imagine, that's not a lot. M most people don't know about it. So I get, when I finally had prostate cancer, my instinct was to not talk about it. And that's what a lot of people, you know, my instinct when I had the heart operation was not to talk about it. Then when I got comfortable with it after a while, I started talking about it. And then I started talking about, you know, uveitis about my daughter. She said, I'm comfortable with you talking about it. So I think it was a natural evolution of becoming comfortable with it and basically saying, what the hell, you know, like, why, like what's the point of not talking about it? Uh, what, to preserve some sense of some image or something? It's crazy. I mean, um, I think about it's it's so interesting that you that you ask me about that because yeah my initial instinct was I don't want anybody to know. Mm. After a while it was like everybody should know. Cuz everybody should be aware of the signs and and the awareness matters. So it became important to me to be an advocate of it. So it just took a little time to get comfortable with it. 
Yeah, from my perspective, in uh, working in a, in a cause for so long, us guys, you know, we don't want to talk about our health. In fact, when it comes time to go to the doctor's office, usually there's a woman who cares about us behind us with a two by four, you know, making sure that we go see the see the doctor. So when it comes to talking about um, our health, particularly issues below the waist, yeah, we don't want to talk about these things. What I did was I contacted all the guys I knew with prostate cancer to get their stories, call them up. So tell me exactly what happened, exactly how you're dealing with it, and exactly what the long-term results are. So I have a web of guys, like five or six people, including my brother being one of them, who I would regularly talk to to see how they were doing. And then from there, it was just a natural progression. And you uh, tapped into each one of them to uh, get their story to help you decide what, what maybe what pathway to take? No, I knew my pathway. They were, they were just, these guys had it and they, they, they had their procedures. Yeah. Maybe I said, why did you choose the procedure you did? Because there's a variety of ways to handle it. You know, essentially there's, there's radiation and seeds or there's operation or, you know, there's radical prostatectomy or a combination of, of many of these things, which if you have prostate cancer, you'll learn about. Um, I just want to know how, yeah, I want to know why they chose what they chose and how the results were. Um, so, uh, but then I did a lot of reading and of course, um, I had been given biopsies for 12 years. So I was diagnosed after five biopsies and biopsies are not the most fun things in the world. Like if you don't like going to a dentist, you're definitely not going to like having a biopsy. I mean, you just not. And, and, uh, but I, you know, the first time I was told to have a biopsy, I had it. And it was, you know, it, it was very uncomfortable. And because uh, my PSA was like 4.3, which is just over the line, right? Just over the line. And then my next blood test showed like a year later, like a 4.9 or a 5.1. So I had another one. But while after the second one, I started to do research going, huh. Um, why does your PSA go up? Because that's a natural question. Is it going up because you got prostate cancer? Is it going up because you have an inf inflammation? Is it going up for any one of a number of reasons? And I find out some things that blew me away. So the next time I had a blood test, I was at 5'7". And I found out that if you have an ejaculation experience within 48 hours of your blood test, your PSA could be up to 20% off. I also found out that if the blood is not refrigerated immediately, it can be off by another 20%. That's a 40% differential. So before I had my third biopsy, I said to the guy, um, let's wait one week. And I abstained from sex. And then I went to a laboratory where they, they chilled the blood right away. And my PSA went from 5.7 to 4.9. Right. And that was a wake up call. That was like, whoa. I just saved myself another biopsy because, and they don't tell that to people. So I say to doctors, why don't you tell that to your patients? Oh, I don't know. Like, seriously, you don't tell your patients that there can be a 20% swing if you have any ejaculation. I mean, forget having sex with another partner. You cannot have an ejaculation. I found that astonishing that they kept that like some sort of a secret. Like, what the, what the hell is that about? I found it astonishing that they don't tell you that if your blood isn't chilled, it could reflect a 20% differential, which means that decisions could be made based on this stuff that shouldn't be made. I, and I thought that was terrible. So at that point, I, I switched urologists. Even uh, riding a bike for a prolonged period of time. Yeah. Increase your, your PSA. You're right. There's a whole bunch of things. And if they don't tell you these things, you know, it's a shot in the dark. So, you know, then my brother was diagnosed. So my brother was diagnosed at the age of 66. My father died of it at 73. Uh, he died of, the, he had cancer in, in his bones. His bones disintegrated. But the basis of his disease was prostate cancer. So we figured, you know, I asked my doctor, I said, how long does it take to get into the bones? He said, untreated, five years, six years, depending. So I said, yeah, it's a good bet. About 66, he probably got it, never went to the doctor. I said, probably. So my brother at 66 got it. So I was 56 when my brother was 66. 
And over the next 10 years, the numbers kept going and going and going and going. The biopsies were negative. And then finally I hit 66 and it was bingo. At that point, I had picked my urologist. I had studied every version of possible treatment. Although um, prostate ablation hadn't been pioneered yet, but CyberKnife had been pioneered. Um, so I had all these options I looked at. And um, I chose the option that worked that I wanted to have. And when you talk to people about this, what's interesting is that the guys who've had radical prostatectomy all say exactly the same thing. When I say, why did you have that? They go, because I just wanted it out of my body. They didn't want to deal with radiation. They didn't want to deal with a mushy prostate, which stays in you. So let me be clear. If you keep it in you, but there has been radiation, your desire and your necessity to pee doesn't decrease because the prostate has expanded and, and pushes on, on your urethra. So who talks about these things? What guys actually say what I'm saying? You know, not that many of them. And I said, you got to have straight talk. And I became a straight talker. That's great. And tell me about with, um, you, you mentioned your brother and your, your dad of prostate cancer too. When you got diagnosed, what went through your mind? Because obviously it's not that, you know, I'm going to speak out and be a straight talker about it, but what, um, take us back to that moment of what goes well, through. It was a discussion I didn't want to hear, but was inevitable in my mind. So my PSA got up to nine, nine and, and then it went back down to eight. No, oh, nine one. They had done extensive MRIs, and they said unless we see an MRI change, we're not going to do another biopsy on you. So I had four at that point. Um, so about eighteen months goes by, and now I'm eleven one. And so they did an MRI, and they saw shadows. And my doctor said, "You know what? We've just pioneered a new biopsy. It's even more invasive than the old biopsy." It's a double biopsy from front and back. And I said to them, in the past, I've always been locally anesthetized, but awake. And they said, you can't be awake for this. We've got to knock you out. I said, that's fine by me. So they knocked me out and they found, they found it. And they called me in and they said, uh, they said, not only do you have prostate cancer, but you have a Gleason of nine. So I go from nothing to a Gleason of nine. How the hell did that happen? Someone that watches it as much as me. So uh, I said, um, so, okay, I can have it removed. And they said, you can, we do that here, but we also do radiation. So why don't you meet with an oncologist? Just because it's a fair thing to do. Talk to an oncologist, ask them if it's something, can they cure it as well? And I did. So at that point, CyberKnife um, had been around but CyberKnife only works if you have a P, if your um, Gleason is under six, from what I understand. At least it was when I, so I was past the number that CyberKnife was even an option with five treatments. So for those of you who see those posters all over the place, CyberKnife, 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 you have to have a lower Gleason score. Do you, are you aware of, of that, by the way? Do you know? Yeah. yeah. That, okay. Again, you got to educate people about this. So he talked to me about the radiation. My brother had radiation and seeds, by the way. He opted to have radiation. Uh, but I, 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 said to, I said to my urologist, you know, what would you do if this was your kid or you? And he said, I would have it removed. But, you know, that's my choice because I'm a surgeon. That's why we have other people here. So we have other divisions here. This was at NYU Langone. So I thought about it and said, no, you know, I want it removed. So I had it removed. And that was that, that's why that decision was made. It was not my brother's decision. That, I mean, my brother decided to have seeds and radiation. Now that you're rising PSA and, uh, you know, knowing that, you're, that your dad and your, your brother had it, um, what factor in that? Meaning? Well, meaning did your your decision on what you wanted to, to do for a treatment? Uh, no, 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 no. I, I, I always knew I wanted it surgically removed. Actually, in the back of my mind. More of my friends have had surgical removal than have had seeds and radiation. Also, I didn't like the option 
Uh, again, sorry if you're hearing sirens in the background, folks, but this is just the way it is when you live in Manhattan. Um, you know, it was made clear to me that if you have it surgically removed and it comes back, you can always have radiation. But if you have radiation first, you can't have it removed because the shape of the prostate becomes very gummy and it becomes impossible to remove it. So you have a backdoor solution uh, when you have it removed. So I chose the backdoor solution, which is um, if it comes back, radiation. But after they did the biopsy, they found that I did not have a Gleason 9. I had a Gleason 7, which was better to hear. But still in all, um, I, I'm assuming the way women look at breast cancer, which is they can tell you that they got it all, but you know, until you die, you can always get it. You know, prostate cancer is, um, you know, it's a tricky little disease. All it takes is one cell to float around the body, one cell to get out and float around and find a home that may or may not kill you at some point. So you got to be aware of it. And then you live it with it for the rest of your life. Yeah, go, go through your mind before they t even told you you had prostate cancer of like, yeah, I think I, I might have it because I have a rising, my, my PSA is rising, my brother had it, my dad had it, or you just kind of put it out of your mind. I don't know. I think until you're diagnosed with it, you don't have it yet. And, and the thing about biopsies for people who don't understand it is it's not an, it's, there's no easy answer. They can do a biopsy. They can take uh, 12 cores out and miss it completely. Uh -huh. They can take, I mean, think about this. They take core in a biopsy, a cores of, of material are taken out of your prostate and examined under a microscope. Okay. And your prostate has a certain uh, size and these cores are small. So if you think about this, I had four biopsies where, where 12 cores were taken out each time. And then I had a fifth biopsy where 24 cores were taken out. My joke was, do I have any prostate left? You know, like if you take out that many cores and there are times they take cores out and miss it completely where well, you still have prostate cancer, except that the cores they remove, you know, they just are not hitting the spot, which is why MRIs are important because it allows them to target the, um, the, uh, the removal of the core in an area that's suspicious. But up until that point, had I had it, it was not detectable because they didn't hit it. So when they did the front and back one, targeted, bingo, they hit it. So, I mean, there were words I didn't want to hear, but I always said to my wife, one day I'm going to hear them. I know one day they're going to tell me, this is it. And they did. And I went, okay, let's set up, let's schedule the operation as soon as possible. Let's just get on with it. You know, let's get on with it. I mean, I made a joke. I said, man, I love sex. I don't want to lose my sex drive. What happens if I just decide, uh, you know, I don't want to have the operation and I'm just going to have sex until I die? And the doctor said, well, you'll have a good couple of years until the pain becomes excruciatingly bad and your illness at, at the end is going to be horrible. But you'll have a couple more years <laughs> if that's the choice. I mean, look, trying to be trying to maintain a sense of humor about this thing, you know, you like can. you're trying to try to be funny about it or, you know, try to be flip about it. So I said, what if I you know, decide I want to just you know, screw for the way I'm enjoying my life and I don't want to destroy my sex life is great. And they go, well, it's going to be great for a while. I want to hit your bones, man. It's not going to be nice. Mm -hmm. So that funny joke conversation lasted about two minutes. And then it was like, OK, gets, let's get back to the, to the issue at hand. Gotcha. Um, I'm, so with your prostate cancer, did, did it, um, now how did it spread or was it, um, you know, contained in your prostate? What, what was the, um, they said it had looked like it had broken out of the capsule, just broken out, but they took everything out around it, including the lymph nodes, found nothing. Right. So yeah. he said to me, just keep getting checked every six months. And as long as it remains in those numbers that are considered undetectable, you're fine. And if it starts moving, then we have to watch it. And then if it starts moving and it moves in a way that reflects some sort of a pattern, we'll have to deal with it. Now, let me say this. In the last three months, 
three friends of mine who have had prostate cancer. Um, one of which was uh, radical and two of which were um, radiation had it come back after 10 years, 14 years and 15 years. Well, that's a sobering number. You've been listening to Prostate Cancer Uncensored, and our guest is Twisted Sisters J.J. French, who himself is a prostate cancer survivor. We spent quite a bit of time with J.J., and in part two, he talks about the twisted side effects of prostate cancer. Be sure to download and listen to that episode as well. A lot of great medical topics came up in our conversation with J.J., so I want to expand on a few of those. I'm joined now by Dr. Neela Gande. Dr. Gande is a surgeon and a urologist with Potomac Urology in the Washington, D.C. area. He's also a member of Zero's Medical Advisory Board. Dr. Gandhi, we mentioned earlier in this podcast that there, there are these factors that could cause an elevated PSA, like riding a bike, sex, and JJ even mentioned the refrigeration of blood. Could you tell us more about um, these other factors as they relate to an elevated PSA? And when we talk to our patients, we do let them know that there are certain um, factors that can increase your PSA. And most commonly, we do see that in times of a urinary tract infection or prostatitis. So something that can cause some sort of um, inflammation to the prostate, which causes them to um, release cells and, and release PSA. So Typically in those times, I would not want to check a PSA level because it would be higher than um, we would normally expect. So in times of um, a urinary tract infection or prostatitis, um, usually we would hold off on it. We do see a natural increase in PSA as well, um, just as men get older uh, and their prostate gets bigger. So with BPH and enlarged prostate, we can see some elevation. Um, in terms of with sex, it's related to ejaculation. And just because the prostate's involved in this process, again, it can lead to transient increases in your PSA levels, as can bike riding. And there's been some studies looking at this to say, what is the effect of on your PSA um, after bike riding or after sexual activity and ejaculation? And I think it's, it's rather commonplace now that, um, you know, discussing this with patients that we typically would want to wait anywhere between 24 to 72 hours after those activities to wait before you draw a PSA level. Um, something to also keep in mind is um, that there's a common medication which actually can decrease your PSA, and this is finasteride. And this is used rather commonly in men, um, either known as Propecia uh, for hair loss or as um, Proscar, uh, which is again, the difference between those two is the dosing of finasteride, but that's used for an enlarged prostate. So keeping that in mind that there are factors that can increase your PSA, but there are also a very common medication and other factors that could also decrease your PSA that have to be taken into account. I know there was a study um, probably in the late 90s or so looking at how storage of PSA or, or even other blood samples can impact um, values. And what they initially had found was that it can impact free PSA more so than anything, but did not really have an effect on your total PSA. So Again, a lot of these uh, blood tests, whether it's you know using a total PSA, a free PSA, or there's some newer blood markers and biomarkers that are available, um, it's, it's using them all in combination together to truly assess a patient's risk status. Now, JJ referenced a mushy prostate being something that men can experience if they opt for radiation versus a prostatectomy. How does radiation affect the prostate? Yeah, radiation typically um, is using x-ray beams to destroy the prostate tissue and destroy the cancer cells. And in doing so, it can impact um, blood vessels um, that surround the prostate and it, it induces ischemia, um, which is kind of trying to limit the blood flow to certain areas. And that's how it induces cell death um, to the tissues. 
And so in that instance, then the prostate, you know, may become a little softer in different areas, but typically we do see it also can become firm as it somewhat hardens up after radiation therapy. So it, it can vary in that sense. Um, typically patients would not know um, in terms of how their prostate feels or what, um, you know, to describe it as like a, a mushy prostate, a lot of that is just based off of just how the digital rectal exam feels in terms of um, what that prostate um, consistency and texture is like. We also talked about the cyber knife treatment. Is there a Gleason grade associated when using this type of treatment? From a Gleason standpoint, typically um, you can be a candidate for any of these treatments from a cyber knife. It's really trying to do um, some focused therapy to the prostate. Um, usually it's utilized for low risk, intermediate risk. It can be utilized in high risk patients as well, um, but they typically may require additional therapies, um, what we call multimodal therapy. So uh, most of the instances that we utilize it would be in a, a low risk or an intermediate risk patient population, which typically varies from the Gleason six up to um, seven um, with some rare instances in the eights. Um, but again, once it's into the eight, nines, tens, you may be looking at more of a multimodal um, therapy where you may require some extended treatments um, to just try and reduce your risk of cancer recurrence. JJ mentioned that he had multiple biopsies. Could you explain why men might need more than one biopsy? I think that's a common thing. Um, we have a lot of patients who we've seen who have had multiple biopsies and they're like, how much prostate is left for you to even biopsy? And, and honestly, when we think about a biopsy, um, it's a very thin sliver of tissue that we take out. And, and the analogy I always give is if you take an orange and you insert a toothpick into that orange, that's about the size of kind of the sample you're taking out. So even if you inserted 12 um, toothpicks into an orange, you still see there's still plenty of orange. It's not like you took a, a large piece out of that orange. And that's similar to what a prostate biopsy is. Um, it's, it's rather commonplace that men may require multiple biopsies. Um, and I do think that trend is decreasing as the utility of MRIs has really increased. And so um, the American Neurologic Association has come out with revised guidelines over a year ago stating that all men should receive a prostate MRI prior to any biopsy, whether it is their first prostate biopsy or a subsequent repeat prostate biopsy. But the benefit of an MRI is to truly assess the prostate to see if there's any abnormal areas, if there's any abnormal lesions that we need to try and target and focus. And that has led to improvements in biopsy techniques where rather than becoming a random sampling of the prostate, we're actually able to target specific areas that may have a higher degree of suspicion for prostate cancer. So I do think that the number of repeat biopsies for diagnosis is likely to go down as MRIs increase. However, there are men who are also on active surveillance and they do get repeat biopsies as well, typically every one to two years, possibly longer, depending how long they've been on surveillance, monitoring if their prostate cancer becomes reclassified or is considered to be progressing before they transition to treatment options. I want to talk about recurrences. Are recurrences for prostate cancer common for patients? Prostate cancer, as, as we know, typically is a slow growing disease process. Um, and the benefits to early detection is to be able to catch it at a time where if it is slow growing, the chances for cure are quite high. Um, and you're talking about greater than 95%, possibly even up to um, you know, 99, 100%. So the importance of early detection is, is critical. Now, this all also correlates with um, Gleason score, family history, really all these different risk factors in determining a patient's risk for prostate cancer recurrence. And so um, as we see someone who has a higher Gleason score, somewhere in the eight, nine, or 10 range, they tend to have a higher risk of prostate cancer 
um, recurrence and will require more therapy. So a lot of times we would like to institute additional therapy um, initially to try and reduce that risk of cancer coming back versus someone who may have a low risk cancer of a Gleason 6 or an intermediate risk um, as a Gleason 7 who may have a lower risk of prostate cancer coming back. They might not require as much treatment up front because their risk already is low for recurrence. Thank you to Dr. Neelay Gandhi and Twisted Sister guitarist JJ French for joining us today. We have much more to discuss with both of them in the next episode. But until then, I'm your host, Jamie Burse. Thank you for listening. You've been listening to Prostate Cancer Uncensored, a podcast produced by Zero, the end of prostate cancer. This episode has been brought to you in partnership with Bayer. Head over to zerocancer.org to learn more about prostate cancer, Zero's programs, and to download more podcasts.